day to all of our viewers and our listeners on the podcast. Welcome to this, the fifth edition of Light Conversations. My name is Philip Constantine, and as always, we are joined by the intellectual giant, Mr. James Portman. Welcome, James. Thanks, Phil. I'll I'll try and live up to that intro that you've given me. Thanks. Oh, there we go. (laughs) Expectations are set. Well, thank you for your time again today. I would like to um, pick up where we left off on the last episode, and that is to discuss this notion of amplification. All of us know what amplifiers are. We most of us have an amplifier down in the um, in the living room, and we amplify sound signals using electricity. Now, I do know in Lightwear that we also amplify light, but let's kick off with um, with electricity, with electronics, and with sound amplification, and maybe let's just talk around the concept of how does one take a small waveform and make it larger? It's really interesting as a subject because it's not necessarily obvious as to what is the right way to go about doing this. The notion of a perfect amplifier, in other words, a device that will take a small signal and turn it into a large signal, is very much a theoretical one. In practice, it turns out that the process of amplification usually injects some kind of distortion into the signal you're trying to amplify or injects noise, in other words, additional signals that get superimposed uh, on top of it. So when we talk about amplification, ideally what we'd like to achieve is amplification of only that thing that we are interested in and not amplification of all the rubbish around it. Uh, Now, this is a much harder task than pure amplification. So in the world of electronics, we find that uh, amplifiers tend to inject electronic noise in the form of electrons caused by random motion of electrons due to thermal effects or similar. In the world of optics, we talk about background light as being a a source of interference. And um, even during the conversion from light to electricity, that conversion process can also inject noise. So when we try and amplify, let's say, a weak signal coming back from a distant object uh, that has reflected the laser beam um, back to a detector or something like that, we need to look at all three of these elements. How do we amplify the light? How do we convert the light to electricity? And then how do we amplify the electricity? Very tricky at each one of these stages. Yes. So the the base premise of a of an electronics amplifier is you need to plug it in the wall, right? And, and that, is, that, is the, that is the input onto the base signal is, um, is your power supply to the, ampli- to the amplifier. Um, and, and that base signal is then modulated according to the input. And, and that's how you really grow the signal, right? So it's not something from nothing. It's, it's an additive process. And as long as we're able to minimize any interference and noise and electromagnetic fields, et cetera, um, pretty much we can take a signal, amplify it, and get something that looks pretty similar, but just of a higher amplitude coming out the other end. Now, what is the corollary for this to, to light? Well, it's actually not obvious at all because... Whilst from a physics point of view, what you're saying is 100% correct, from an engineering point of view, we inevitably try and break these rules, and we do try and get something for nothing. So in the case of an, uh, yeah, of an electronics amplifier, what you find is that you are providing all the signal into the amplifier. In other words, you start with a signal of a particular size, and you're constrained by the fact that you only have a certain amplitude of signal, for example, at certain frequencies. Mm. When you look at the world of light, This is not necessarily the case because it turns out that light, once it hits a surface, scatters in all directions, which means there's a lot more of it out there than we may be feeding into our optical amplifier. So imagine, for example, that you had um, a lens as a collection device. So here's, here's a lens. This is an optical amplifier. If I put my hand in front of it, you can see it makes the hand look bigger. All right. So what's the difference between a large lens and a small lens? Well, it turns out that a small lens will collect a certain amount of the signal that comes back, whereas a large lens will collect more. And if you look over my shoulder, you'll see the Mead telescope there, which has a a nine inch lens in it. The idea there is to collect more light. So in the world of optical amplification, you can cheat 
meaning you can make the signal bigger simply by collecting more of it. You don't need to add additional power or energy to it in order to get a bigger signal. You can simply use larger optics and collect more of the available photons that are out there. This is not true in the world of electronics because the electrons live in a piece of wire and the wire is fed into the input of the amplifier and you only have that number of electrons, you don't have any more. So the way to make it bigger is to add electrons and that's why you need to plug it into the wall and have a power supply to add additional energy. So in fact in optical amplification you have two choices. You can start with more signal by using bigger optics or you can use optical amplification by adding additional energy to, to the light source. And of course, that's how a laser works in its own right. But on the detection side, we tend not to use um, energy additive amplification. Instead, what we try to do is gather more energy. So that's interesting. Uh, let's talk for a minute just about the dimensions of amplification, because I, um, when, when you held the magnifying glass up, I, I, I thought to myself, well, if you're taking a small image and you're making it bigger, is, is that amplification or is it kind of a reinforcing distortment of the image and just it's a visual distortion of something that's small that's becoming bigger? Um, manipulation, not distortion, really. So what are the dimensions of visual amplification? Because the obvious one is, right, I have a very dim signal. Let's make it brighter. Um, but maybe just talk us through that for a second. It's really critical to understand that, especially in the world of LiDAR. Unfortunately, we are kind of preconditioned to, to look at light signals in the form of images. And we assume that, for example, the perfect reproduction of an image on a larger scale represents some form of amplification. And whilst it's true conceptually that that is the case, it's not necessarily the most effective form of amplification. Because as you've mentioned, making the image brighter is also a form of amplification. You don't necessarily have to make it bigger. Now, yes. when, we, when we look at the world of LiDAR, what we care about is the amount of energy that we're dealing with. We care less about any image distortion. Now, this actually, uh, I first heard about it in the world of astronomy, where you end up with two different types of telescopes. You end up with a telescope that is designed to provide perfect image reproduction. And in this case, you would literally take a photograph of the object that you want to see. But there's a different type of telescope that uses a spectrograph. And the purpose of the spectrograph is to analyze the wavelengths that are within a particular space. And it turns out the only thing you care about with a spectrograph is how much energy you have. You don't care if the image is distorted or not, you just want it to be as bright as possible. So if you look at the world's largest telescopes, many of them are actually spectrographs, then they don't necessarily produce beautiful images, amazingly enough. But what they do is they collect an enormous number of photons. And that is the way that they make the information bright enough or strong enough, if you like, to analyze. So in a LiDAR system, we care about having a strong signal. We don't care about zero distortion. That is not necessary. And here we begin to see a separation between the electronics, the rules of physics, mm. the optics, and so on, between, let's say, camera systems and LiDAR systems. These are not identical systems at all. And the, the points of optimization, the engineering sweet spots, if you like, are very different between these two systems. And that's obviously what governs the trade-offs, right, in terms of wanting a clear distortion-free image versus just pumping the power. Very interesting. I'd like okay. to consider for a second the, the different levels, the different modalities of amplification that if we take a LiDAR device as an example, um, I do know that some of our very small LiDARs um, in Lightway run, run off a watch battery. So how does one start with, you know, one and a half volts from a watch battery to having an electrical signal that's able to fire a laser at hundreds of volts? And then that's the conversion, obviously, from, um, from electrons to, to light, to photons. The message travels, it comes back, and then there's an interpretation by the sensor. So maybe just talk us through that leg of the journey and then I have a follow-up question. So this is where you begin to talk about system design, where the notion of creating 
energy exactly where you need it and when you need it, at the amplitude that you need it, at the power that you need it, is critical to the design of a complete system. Whilst you can fudge it a little bit by saying, oh, we'll just use a very high power laser, the problem is you may need a substation to drive that laser. Mm. So you can cheat. Um, you, can, you can just simply pour a lot of energy into things um, and therefore get a lot of energy out. But when you're trying to design a product, especially a product like a LiDAR, you want to be really careful about how you approach each of these requirements, whether it's amplifying light on the way out or amplifying it on the way back. Because if you are constrained from a commercial point of view by, let's say, size and weight, which is where, for example, the light where micro LiDARs tend to be used is, is in places where weight is critical. So that would be on a drone or a self-driving vehicle of some sort. You're constrained by physical dimensions. So, for example, here's a, a complete LiDAR system um, made by Lightwear. And you can see, first of all, that the optics are surprisingly small. Mm. What that means is that this system doesn't rely entirely on optical amplification. It's also dealing with the other modes of amplification, the conversion mm. from light to electricity and the amplifier amplification of electricity on its own. Now, I won't go into details of the circuitry required to do this just yet, because I think we're still at a, at a kind of a physics level understanding of what's going on here. But suffice it to say, in future episodes, I'd really like to discuss the nitty gritty of these things, mm -hmm. because it's very unconventional. I think most engineers are trained in the world of audio amplifiers or continuous wave amplifiers, which would be used in communication systems. When you're talking about a LiDAR device, you're talking about a pulse signal as well. And surprise, right. surprise, the moment you pulse something, you can throw all the equations out of the window and you have to start on a completely different premise, on a completely different notion about what is a signal and how you amplify a signal. Because it's no longer just a radio wave, in other words, a continuous wave, it's a short burst of energy. And amplifying short bursts of energy turns out to be very different to amplifying continuous mm. streams of energy. Uh, it's a great fun subject. And just give us an idea, what is, um, what, what is the length of, of a pulse? If you're talking about a pulse, oh, is it, a, is it a, a second, a millisecond, a microsecond? I mean, what, what is a pulse? So modern LiDAR systems run with pulse lengths typically in the region of 1 to 20 nanoseconds. They can, some of the uh, longer range ones may run with a pulse width of up to 100 nanoseconds, and some of the really high speed ones may be down in the 100 picoseconds or even less than that. Mm -hmm. These are incredibly short pulses. And what it means is that when you try and amplify that energy, you discover that your amplification methodology may be fundamentally limited because of the speed that's involved. So if you have a signal, let's say, with a rise time of less than one nanosecond, your amplifier has to be able to what they call slew at that speed. In other words, it has to be able to track that rapid change uh, in the signal. And yes. here, here is where something like optical amplification is extremely valuable because it has no fundamental speed limit. It'll operate at the speed of light. Whereas conversion from optical signals into electronic signals can be horribly frequency dependent. So in other words, high speed signals, yeah. you can feed into an amplifier and you get nothing out the other end, no matter how big the signal is that you put in. And the same yeah. applies to pure ele electrical amplification as well. High speed signals just don't want to be amplified. They, they don't like it. Yeah. And I mean, that's obviously a constraint also just of, of the silicon on which these components sit. From from a from an electronic standpoint, so is it then fair to say if if um, if one considers the ability to then you have the choice to amplify part of the signal in electronics, part of the signal in light. So the larger my optics, if we were to do lenses this side, I would have to do a lot less amplification on the electronic side. It's a lot cleaner. It's a lot purer. It's a lot quicker. We're moving at the speed of light. There's no inertia in the signal. It's there's fewer constraints. As one then moves to smaller and smaller, just just hold that sensor up again. I mean, what what is the what is the dimension of the optic there? If if you just take one lens across, it's twelve millimeters across on the receiving lens. Twelve millimeters. So yes. as one moves from from something that's inches across to to a twelve millimeter lens that must exponentially reduce your ability to do any optical amplification on, on a unit like that, which does that then push more of your amplification into electronics? And how, where do you decide that switchover point between what percentage of our amplification will happen in optics as opposed to electronics? 
Yeah, in the end, it turns out it's the customer that decides. Uh, unfortunately, one of the problems with being an engineer is that you're trying to find practical solutions. So whilst NASA did use the 200-inch Mount Palomar telescope for their first uh, lunar laser ranging project, you could imagine that's a pretty difficult thing to carry around. Um, and if you now want to put something like that onto a drone, it's just not going to happen. So it turns out that customers tend to define your primary constraint. And if it's size, in this case, as we're discussing with optical amplification, then you start with the best optics that you can manage at that size. From here on, the game gets very, very difficult. And the smaller you make your system, as you've so rightly said, the harder it becomes. And the challenge of designing efficient, high-performing electronics with the right speed, with the right stability to measure picosecond level events, this is what the world of LiDAR is all about. Wow, challenging business, great. Thank you so much, James. That's, uh, that's been en enlightening. <laughs> Great. Well, that's it for uh, episode five of Light Conversations. Next week, uh, we are going to explore the conversion of electrons to photons. And these are the, the detectors that sit in the LiDAR devices that do this conversion. And there's a whole interesting topic around this on how the converters work and how we are able to translate these photons back into electrons to be able to do measurement distance within LIDARs. So thank you for your time today. Please subscribe to the channel. Click the subscribe button now, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.